Do you ever find that you're stuck in the same cycle no matter how many times you try to change? Today we're going to talk about the reason why you try strategy after strategy and wind up right back at square one. I think more and more people are noticing like, oh, it's great to learn these strategies, implement them, talk about self-care, etc. But I find that a lot of people will kind of keep going in circles. So yeah, they have better coping strategies, but they keep finding themselves in similar situations that are difficult and challenging. They keep getting into relationships with the people who invalidate them, you know, and, and yeah, they can deal with it better, but why do they keep going into that same cycle over and over again? This is the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Duff, and today I have an awesome interview with Dr. Judy Ho. She's focused for years about teaching people people's skills to better themselves in therapy until she realized that sometimes skills aren't enough. You actually need to dig a bit deeper. CBT, dialectal behavior therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, that's been my whole deal. But uh, yeah, over time, I just realized if you don't revisit the past at least a little bit, you're not going to break those patterns going forward. And I think mm. that that's what got me more interested in diving in deeper to attachment theory. I hope you stay tuned for this interview because today we're going to talk about how our early attachments shape who we are, why you might feel stuck in cycles, and what it takes to make lasting change. I said, you know, just imagine your adult self sitting next to your inner child and asking, what do you need? And like, that's the only question that you need to ask. And then you just wait. You just wait and see what your child is saying. And she started crying in session because the only thing that kept coming back of what the inner child needed is just like love. She just needed to feel loved. She never felt loved at any point mm -hmm. in her life. And ever since this trauma, like she just never, never really felt love from anyone. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you watch or listen. If you have any questions, topics for the show or guest suggestions, shoot me an email to duffthepsych at gmail.com. And with all that said, enjoy this interview with Dr. Judy Ho. Okay, everybody, we have an awesome guest today. We have uh, Dr. Judy Ho. Judy is a uh, neuropsychologist like myself. She's also a tenured professor over at Pepperdine and an author. Most recently, she published a book called The New Rules of Attachment. And you can find Judy just about everywhere, online, on TV, being an expert guest. You guys will see why. I could go into more detail, but Judy, your CV is literally 18 pages long. <laughs> <laughs> You have it on your website, so I took a look at it, and uh, oh my literally God. 18 pages. Did you know that? Yeah, I know it's getting long. I might have to trim it down a little bit so it's not so ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> These things tend to accumulate over time. Yes. Um, before we begin, I, I owe you a few things. I owe you an apology and an explanation and also some praise, okay? Aww. So, first off, um, I've been a little bit of a pain to work with. I gave you a, a sudden reschedule over the weekend, which <laughs> you were totally cool with. I also, I don't know if you remember, we talked back in like 2018. Do you remember that? I do. Um, did you notice that your, your episode never got on the air, that I never published it? Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to explain a little bit about that because I, I felt bad about it. Um, <laughs> So back at that time, I mean, this was a long time ago, right? 2018. Yeah. Um, you caught me right when I stopped doing interviews for the show. Um, <gasps> it, that was when I had small kids and it was really, really hard. Like I have kids, you know, they're still here and they might scream or something like that, but they were a lot yeah. more intrusive at that time and things were a lot more unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And I had a, um, actually like a TV colleague of yours on the show and she was talking about um, one of the you know, most traumatic things you could think of, you know, losing a spouse to, to suicide. And she's in the middle of telling the story. And I got like an emergency call about the kids. And I was like, I'm so oh. sorry. I have to stop you. I, I, I got to go address this. And I'm like, oh this goodness. is not the time for me to be doing interviews. Like I got yeah. really, I just, I, so yours and a few other ones got lost in the shuffle because I just said, forget this. I'm not doing it for a while. So I'm just recently back to it. So I'm really uh, grateful that you're giving me a time, you know, to have a second chance with you. <laughs> oh my gosh. No, of course. And you know what? I totally understand. So I had my son in 2021 Mm. And really the first couple of years, I mean, he's, oh, he's two and a half now, but you know, yeah. the first two years, it was like a blur and it's still kind of like that when I'm working from home, it's just, things can come up all the time, you know? So don't even Absolutely. apologize. I totally <laughs> get it. And I think I get it now more than I ever would being a mother to a young child. Yeah. Uh, before I had kids, I think I'm like, mm, what's going on? Like, you don't really know. Cause you've never... Like you, you, you understand that they're going through that, but you don't really know until you go through it yourself, I think. Right. And yeah. sometimes they're skilled at, at 
you know, I would never want to call kids inconvenient, but they're very skilled at coming in at just not the right time with uh -huh. stuff like that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So no worries at all. And I'm so glad that we get to reconnect. Yeah. So that leads into the praise. Like I, I, you are so gracious and, you know, it, not only just like with me, but in everybody that I've seen you interact with. And I think that also rolls over into your team, the person that I was working with on your team to schedule with. Like, uh, I just really appreciate that about you. You seem very, very pleased to just be a part of things and like genuine. So oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That's really kind. And I will definitely pass that along to Blaine because she's she's awesome. So yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like when I'm like, hey, sorry, I have to reschedule this. And she's like, thank you so much. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I know she's super kind. Uh, so all of that aside, um, I want to talk about, you know, some of the stuff related to your, your newest book. Um, I don't know that I asked you in the past or have gotten an idea though, like, why did you get into mental health in the first place? Like, why did you come into this field? Yeah. So actually I wanted to be a psychologist since I was in high school. And crazily enough, I'd stuck with that. And and the reason is I was motivated by my work in the Big Brother Big Sister program. So when I was oh. 15, I joined the program because I thought it would look good for college. I mean, honestly, I was like, sounds fun, hang out with little kids and it's a resume builder. I didn't really uh, realize at the time what kind of impact it was gonna have on my life because the, the little girl I was paired with was a foster child. She had been in about, I think, 10 foster homes by the time she was 10. I mean, it's just mm. so crazy. She has nobody consistent in her life. And of course, I was 15. What did I know? I didn't know anything, but I just showed sure. up every week, took her to get ice cream, went to the park, went to movies. And I, I quickly became one of the most consistent people in her life. And I realized what a big impact it was having on her, just on her self-esteem and her ability to tackle challenges, just to know that there was somebody in her corner, essentially. Mm -hmm. And I just realized, you know, this is something that I would love to devote my life to because one person can make such a huge impact. And that's really the, the impetus for why I became interested in psychology. And then I went to Berkeley, studied psychology and business. At that time, I was still thinking, well, maybe business will be a fallback in case psychology doesn't work out, et cetera. But really, I was, I was meant for this field, I think. And I feel very grateful every day that this is my job. Where, um, whereabouts did you, did you grow up? I grew up in Taiwan for the first oh. nine years of my life. And then I went to Syracuse, New York, and then I ended up in Southern California around junior high school. So oh, okay. I've been in Southern California through high school, and then I went up and down the coast for training and then came back to Los Angeles for my postdoctoral fellowship. What was mental health and psychology, how was it thought of in your family? Uh, you know, I have a very interesting, traditional yet open-minded family. Like they're they're traditional mm. in some ways, but also really open-minded at others. They were extremely supportive of me pursuing this field, even though they themselves didn't necessarily understand it all that much. My dad was always interested in psychology. I remember one of the first books he gave me was a book about psychology when I was ten, and so. Yeah, it's like this really crazy like book in it's in Chinese print. I bet it's also in a, in in English. I have to see if there's a translation. But essentially, it was like it was like black it was called like black psycho like psychology techniques. It was about manipulating people. Can you believe oh, that my dad dark, gave me dark psychology. Yes. <laughs> Can you believe that my dad gave me a book like that when I was 10? I mean, but that that's what he did. So, uh, yeah. So, that planted so the seed. <laughs> that planted the seed. Um, maybe that's why I'm also interested in forensic psychology and I mm -hmm. do some of that work. But anyway, um, my parents have been very, very open, very supportive. But I will say that in some of our extended family members who have struggled with mental health, it's very hard for my extended family, as well as my nuclear family, to really understand that because they just didn't have that vocabulary growing up. That wasn't really part of the cultural dialogue. And so ha seeing some of my extended family have um, suf suffering with depression, um, they don't really know what to make of it. Like no one talks about it. No one talks about it. Yeah. Right. You can't just roll in with the, the jargon that people, you know, current generations might fully understand from TikTok and such, but you can't exactly just roll in and be talking about all of these terminologies. Exactly. And I think part of it is that people are still feeling um, in much of the traditional Chinese culture that 
mental health issues are a character flaw. Mm -hmm. Like there's something that's weak about them and that's why they're having these symptoms. So I think that's what makes it hard to have a engaged dialogue about, you know? Right, because first you have to admit that that's a thing, which is shameful, and then you have to go right. step beyond that to actually do something about it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when I was looking through um, your CV, I didn't do the, the, like a deep, deep dive, don't worry, but I, um, <laughs> I noticed, you know, a lot of your early work, like so like bachelor's, master's, stuff like that, you focused on things like um, parents, role models, acculturation, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, yeah. now you're writing about attachment. Is this sort of a full circle for you yeah. kind of returning to form? I, I do. I do feel like that, you know, so much of my earlier work was about, like you said, role models and families, par partially about families and children, because my doctoral mentor at the time, that's something that she was really into. And when you go through doctoral program, you're in their research team, you sure. do what your advisor is doing, right? They're kind of your model. But I, I also felt like it really starts with children. You know, I mean, I, I think that that's more, uh, more poignant than ever looking at my own child. <laughs> like, you, I'm really just trying so hard to give them a good foundation for the rest of their lives, you know? And so I think it just really goes back to that early upbringing and what you believe about the world. That's what attachment theory is all about. When did you, um, when did you start writing this book? Like, when did you start the process of, of diving into it? Uh, probably in 2020 or 2021, early 2021. So it's before you, like, had my got child. pregnant? Yeah, so it was before I got pregnant. I, yeah. think I, I think I locked in the, I don't remember when I got my contract, actually, but it was, like, around that time. But it was just so interesting getting the contract and then delivering my child and then trying to write the book while I was a brand new mother and not sleeping. So I basically returned back to my grad school days. I'm sure you you experienced that too when your children were younger. Like you don't really sleep and then your, your whole schedule gets all out of whack. So I'm writing drafts of this book at like three in the morning from my bed between right. breastfeeding. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Just uh, like typing on the iPad or whatever. Yeah. To... And I'm like, this is not my best, you know, um, but I, I, that was also the only time I could really get things done. So I, I did a lot of this writing very late night, um, which reminded me a lot of grad school. But yeah, 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 for sure. There was a time in grad school where I was convinced I could just sleep every other day. I'm like, I can be uh -huh. so much more efficient if I just sleep every other day. Oh, and yeah. Then of course, that backfired eventually. Actually, but yeah, yes, I did that too. I did that too. Well, you know, you could act, your body could actually take it when you're in your 20s and early 30s, but maybe I mean, definitely not now. My my body's like, no, Hell thank no. you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that, I mean, that's just a really interesting aspect of this that like you are writing about attachment, which you haven't fully dove into in your other you know books that you published, um, mm -hmm. and also at the same time forming attachments with with a new child. So I think that's mm -hmm. that's really really interesting. Yeah, but you had the idea before you know you you had your kid. So you know people are familiar with attachment in some way. I think a lot of people have some degree of language for it from social media. You know, right. it's, there's a lot of pop psychology stuff related to attachment. Why is now the time for you to be putting out a book like this? I think it's really about understanding the basis of why people keep saying they're struggling with the same things. So mm. I think that a lot of people are learning, you know, I mean, this, the great thing about it is that we are starting to demystify mental health and you're, you're, you've been a big part of that movement as well. Like just putting it out into people's daily language, making it feel like it's not so scary. Mm -hmm. And I think more and more people are noticing like, oh, it's great to learn these strategies, implement them, talk about self-care, et cetera. But I find that a lot of people will kind of keep going in circles. So yeah, they have better coping strategies, but they keep finding themselves in similar situations that are difficult and challenging. They keep getting into relationships with the people who invalidate them, you know, and, and yeah, they can deal with it better, but why do they keep going into that same cycle over and over again? And so for me, I think you have to go back into your past enough to recognize where the roots of this is so mm. that you can actually make lasting change and move towards better solutions, not just kind of being in the same wheel over and over again. And that, and that, and that's why I decided that this was an important book to write at this time, because it really all goes back to those foundational beliefs about who you are. And attachment theory has a big part in developing that for yourself. 
This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. It is so easy when we are so busy to forget about ourselves when it comes to taking the kids to school, when it comes to working, when it comes to caring for a spouse or maybe even an elderly parent. A lot of us have just so much going on that we tend to get lost in the shuffle. And it's really, really important to have some non-negotiables when it comes to self-care. For me, these are things like physical exercise, spending some time by myself, just playing video games, and of course, relaxing with the people that I care about. For you, it may be something different, and there's no better tool to get in touch with what you enjoy and what should be your non-negotiables than therapy. So if you're thinking of giving therapy a try, check out BetterHelp. It's entirely online. It's designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. All you do is fill out a brief questionnaire, and that'll get you matched with a licensed therapist, and you can change therapists at any time for no additional charge. So never skip a therapy day with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Duff to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Duff for 10% off your first month. All right, let's get back to it. Was there any impetus or any series of things that got you thinking more about this? Like, did you, is this a, is this a bit of a change to your approach to the, the recognition that you kind of need to go deeper to stop repeating? Oh, for sure. I've, I'm a skills-based therapist. That's been so much of my training and so much of my focus. So that's CBT, dialectal behavior therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy. That's been my whole deal. Nuts and, and bolts stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like it's nice because you kind of solve problems in the here and now, and that's mm -hmm. a wonderful feeling to see those uh, effects so quickly for your, for your patients. But uh, yeah, over time, I just realized if you don't revisit the past at least a little bit, you're not going to break those patterns going forward. And I think mm -hmm. that that's what got me more interested in diving in deeper to attachment theory. And of course, there's other forms of diving into your past. There's more traditional psychodynamic approaches. While I'm interested in those, I, I think that attachment theory for me still feel so much more like there's a big connection to the other work, the other work that I do, as opposed to a completely brand new modality. Mm -hmm. And so like, you don't have to translate it from one thing to something completely unrelated. It actually flows into. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then of course, experientially being a parent just brings up all kinds of thoughts and considerations about attachment and also helps me to reflect on my own childhood too mm -hmm. and seeing my parents approach and i believe my parents did their best but i definitely think that there were some things that happened in my childhood that led me to have an avoidant attachment earlier in my life before i did my own healing work where i feel like i'm mostly securely attached most of the time, but when I'm stressed, I still have those avoidant attachment shadows where I just start to isolate myself. I never talk to anybody else about my problems. I want to solve everything myself. You know, I, I notice those things about myself still. And so I think mm. that some of that did come from my own upbringing. And while I think my parents did the very best that they could at the time, um, they, they did instill some of those lessons that, that, that led me to develop that particular attachment style as a child. So there's, Secure attachment kind of on one side, right? That's yep. that's the ideal that we strive for in terms of ourselves or imparting to our, mm -hmm. our loved ones. And then there are a few different insecure attachment styles. Can you give uh, a top level uh, about, about that just so people kind of have the same language here? Yeah, definitely. So we have secure attachment and generally a person with secure attachment, they'll they'll be pretty much able to separate themselves from other people while still caring about them at the same time. They have a good level of individuality, but they're not afraid to ask for help. Generally, they believe that good things can happen to them, especially if they put in the effort. And they generally have a pretty stable self-concept. They know who they are, um, and they know that they can be resilient in face of challenges. That's the secure, atta the secure attachment style. Mm -hmm. The three different insecure attachments, um, I'll start with the anxious attachment style. This is a person who might be more prone to codependency and rescuing other people because they really feel like they feel the most secure when they're around others and are being validated by other people. So they may have a harder time initiating on their own. They tend to rely on other people to tell them how they might feel about themselves. So they kind of need that external reinforcement more often than the other mm -hmm. types. And they generally have a more positive view of other people as opposed to themselves. They might struggle with some lower self-esteem and, and wondering who they are in the world um, and just needing a little bit more of that support, which is what leads them to those codependency uh, patterns because 
they think, well, if I'm there for you, then maybe you'll be there for me when I need it. Mm -hmm. um, the avoidant attachment is what I would describe as a proverbial lone wolf. They, they kind of pride themselves on independence. They like to be self-sufficient. They tend to identify very heavily with their careers and their goals because that's a way tor towards an identity that is theirs. When they're feeling trouble, they don't tend to ask for help because they don't want to be disappointed. So then they try to solve all these problems themselves. But obviously, that's not always possible. We all need connection. And avoidantly attached people, if their career starts to go off the rails or they start to feel like there's a transition or a loss in one phase of life to another, for example, moving from a working person to being uh, um, retired, retired. Mm -hmm. exactly, like they, they tend to struggle with essentially a mid or late life crisis at that mm -hmm. time because they're like, well, then who am I without this identity that was so important to me? And then the disorganized attachment, I think is the most misunderstood. And you probably know that just hearing kind of how people talk about it. People think about disorganized attachment as the one that's the most challenging to heal. These are the people who have borderline personality disorder or other kinds of personality disorders. They're impossible to be with in a relationship, et cetera. But I think the defining feature of the disorganized attached person is that they're constantly in fight or flight. And mm -hmm. it's because of certain childhood experiences that they had that makes them feel like they're not ever safe. And so when you're constantly in fight or flight, you're not gonna be able to make better decisions. You're not gonna be able to self-actualize towards goals or make healthy relationship decisions or know what it really feels like to have interdependence and co-regulation with another person. So mm -hmm. that's why sometimes disorganized people can run hot or cold or they feel like their coping strategies are all over the place. There's not like one consistent theme. It's because they're just trying to do whatever they need to in the moment to survive that moment. So that's really what I think about the disorganized attachment that, that a lot of people think that this is the worst attachment style ever. I, I think that they can heal just like any of the other attachment styles. Do you consider that to be because there's been a lack of opportunity to learn for, for like the, the disorganized attachment that they yeah. never had the opportunity to learn how to, like you said, co-regulate or you know feel yeah. security, things like that? Yeah, they never really had the right role models to do that with or anybody to show them that way. And then I think just in terms of the literature and how it even uh, evolved as a subtype, it really got the short end of the sick, even when you look at the earlier research that established the attachment styles. Essentially, the, the, the researchers just dumped everybody that they couldn't really explain or categorize into this disorganized attached style and called it disorganized because they're disorganized, you know? Um, Are you referring to like the monkey research, like the, the strange situation research? Or yeah, that? I'm talking about the strange situation. Mm. So, you know, with Mary Ainsworth and with John Bowlby, like the first time that they did the uh, attachment uh, research, Research, um, they just categorized these kids that they couldn't really find consistency with all into this disorganized category. Mm -hmm. And they're like, okay, this is definitely an insecure type, but we don't exactly know what we're seeing. So actually it was a very diverse subtype. It wasn't like there sure. was a theme, like anxious and avoidant. It was pretty clear what their coping strategies were. It was like a theme at least, you know? And it's the like they just messed up. <laughs> yeah, kind of, it was like a catch all. I was like, oh sure. no, this is like the IBS of attachment styles where you just <laughs> diagnose somebody with that and just call it a day, you know? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Is it, um, do people, at least in terms of how you think about it or how it is thought about generally, do people fall very strictly into one category or another when it comes to attachment styles or is it a bit more fluid? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that question. I do think it's more fluid. I also think that there's mostly combination styles rather than just one type. Most of the people I've worked with are a combination of two types. And mm -hmm it might show up in different arenas of their life. So maybe in their romantic relationships, they're a little bit more avoidant, but maybe in their friendships and at work, they're more anxious, you know? I mean, that is a very, very common way of expressing themselves. And also, it, it's more fluid in that somebody could have secure attachment a lot of the time, but then when they're triggered by something that feels stressful for them or even traumatic, then some of the insecure attachment styles that maybe they embodied earlier in life are going to peak up again. So I think that it, it's something that is much more fluid than people generally wanted to believe. Kind of like personality traits. You people yeah. think, oh, well, are you an extrovert? Are you yeah. an introvert? Yeah. Right. Well, most of the time, some people are somewhere along the spectrum in different contexts, et cetera. So you think of exactly. it similarly for attachment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think that it's just funny that you brought up the extrovert introvert thing. I feel like 
it's definitely contextual. You know, most people I know will say, yeah, I'm mostly an extrovert, but there's so many days where they just want to be more like an introvert. And I think that that's similar to attachment styles for sure. Right. Or if they have to small talk at a business thing, they're going to be more drained than anything else, even Mm -hmm. though, you know, ostensibly they spend a lot of time with other people. Yes, exactly. For sure. You, you mentioned, you know, in talking about the insecure attachment styles, how they can kind of come up when pressed with some sort of stimulus. Do you find that they're like defenses? Are they kind of protective in some sort of way? Yeah, I think that they're defenses and that they're protective and that because they have worked in various forms in the past, even if it's not the healthiest thing, that's why they keep going back to it, you know? Mm. So an avoidantly attached person, um, they, they might during times of stress, you know, do more work and become more of the workaholic that they're known to be because it causes them one, a good distraction and a way to still feeling good about themselves somehow. But also it allows them to avoid their problems in a very, I think feels like a societally supportive way, meaning that when the person is emotionally distressed, they work even more. If their family complains, they're like, well, but I'm the breadwinner of the family. All I'm trying to do is provide for the family. And then it's hard to argue with them. Like, oh, that's true. That's what you're doing. You know, Mm -hmm. so it kind of allows them to cope with the, you know, the the negative experience that they really Mm -hmm. can't tolerate very well. But also it keeps people um, off their backs a little bit, at least temporarily, you know? Yeah. Temporary is a good point, right? Because these yeah. there's a reason these things keep coming back. So that much like anything in psychology, you know, avoidance tends to perpetuate things versus approach, which is hard but tends to be more helpful in the end. Exactly. Would you say that's yeah? Yeah, exactly. What do you think people tend to get wrong about attachment? You know, people that you see day to day, hear about online, etc. What do they tend to get wrong about attachment? I think the the biggest thing is that people think that you're kind of just stuck with your attachment style. And when you look at the articles that are more prevalent online or even on social media, which is where people Mm -hmm. get their mental health information these days, for better or for worse, um, it almost feels like it's a personality style that you just have to work with. And Mm -hmm. I don't think that that's true. I think that if you think of it as a coping strategy, then it's something that can be changed because it developed at some point. And it's solidified at some point. And just like any habit, you can also break it and establish new habits. So I think it it shouldn't be thought of so much as a personality style. It should be thought of more as what it is, which is a coping strategy. And we can obviously shift our coping strategies or at least add to them so that they're more balanced over time. Mm -hmm. How does one begin to recognize where they're falling on the spectrum in different contexts, what the, how, how do they learn about their attachment if they've never been really uh, given a, a lot of guidance on that? Yeah, well, I, I have a quiz that's available on my website for free that you guys can use, and also it's in my book, but that's a good way just to kind of get more information because mm-hmm. the attachment quiz is built into different domains of life. So it looks at how you, oh how you think and how you solve problems at work versus in romantic relationships versus in your family versus in friendships, et cetera. And it can tell you also where your attachment styles, if there are any problematic ones, where are they more likely to come up? And so it's a good way to kind of get an assessment on your life that feels more concrete because I think that for some people, attachment style still feels very kind of, kind of a, it feels a little bit vague for them, maybe, you know? And so this makes it more concrete when you can look at it in the different domains of your life and and how you think and how you behave. Um, So that's a good way to to learn. And then I think the other way is, of course, talking to people who might be interested in the same topic. I've always find that you learn so much when uh, conversing with somebody that Mm -hmm. you really trust, you know, and kind of going through things that have happened. I mean, my sister and I, Um, you know, we've talked about like being raised like with traditional Chinese values and where like achievements, very, very important. Um, and you know, those things, I, I have my parents to thank and credit for my ambition and my perseverance, but also we never talked about emotions. Like that's just not something that they did with their families. So they didn't really know how to do it with us. And I think that it was good to talk to my sister about it because she also kind of 
felt the same throughout growing up that okay as long as i was like bringing home a good report card mm -hmm. everything was fine but anytime i said hey i feel sad like the the our parents were trying to help but they would just say well don't feel sad why would you feel sad and it's just like kind of blow past that <laughs> look, at, you know? look at what you have yeah exactly <laughs> you should be happy. exactly oh, okay exactly problem solved <laughs> right problem solved okay i'm all better now <laughs> <laughs> thanks for that <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and you also have talked before about um the self-talk involved with different attachment styles. Um, yeah. That's something that I hadn't really, you know, considered as a, as a way to recognize attachment styles or just understand them better. Can you talk a bit more about, about that aspect? Yeah, absolutely. I think that this is one of the aspects of attachment that people don't necessarily recognize, but then once you learn about it, you say, oh yeah, that makes sense. And it's because your attachment styles are foundational to what you believe about yourself. And self-talk is ultimately about your self-beliefs as well as your beliefs about other people. And when you have secure attachment, you tend to have self-talk that is more balanced, that feels more resilient, um, that understands that you are going to be able to achieve and deserve good outcomes. But when you have insecure attachment, you're more likely to develop certain beliefs like people can't be trusted, I can only rely on myself, um, other people is, are more important than me, you know, mm. these things that are a little bit off balance and don't necessarily honor who you are. And every single attachment style has kind of a slightly different type of self-talk that's oriented towards different things um, that relate to how they cope. And of course, over time, that self-talk gets rehearsed over and over again, and your brain just keeps reinforcing the same information. And even when it comes across things that might uh, actually disprove some of your beliefs, mm -hmm. your brain, unless you're consciously attuned to it, your brain is much more likely just to either forget about it, have selective memory, or fold it in somehow to your pre-existing ideas. And that's why it takes conscious effort to really navigate your self-talk in a way that's healthy because you can't just expect that on autopilot, your brain's gonna recognize that changes are happening or that maybe these old beliefs don't, don't hold water anymore in your life now. It takes patience too, right? Because you yeah. can't just, um, I know that you do in your book, you do have some things related to like mantras and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, self statements. Yeah. And, it, you know, from my understanding, you can't just sort of snap your fingers and, and say, hey, I deserve uh, to feel good or I deserve love or whatever. And it be something you actually believe. But right. when you think back to the foundations of, you know, your primary caregivers and how you learn these things, right? It's sort of about training what your attention is. We're both neuropsychologists. So it's yeah. like, to me, I think about it, it's, it's training what your attention is biased toward, right? Exactly. And in order to undo that, that takes some repetition, some time probably. Yeah, that definitely takes time. And it's not something that you can do in one day, but even these small shifts make such a difference. You know, um, your, your mind does start to take in this information, especially when you're consciously attuned to it, and it can change those patterns. And so self-talk is changeable at any time, but it does take, like you said, a little conscious effort. And I always like to remind people, uh, it takes about four to six weeks for a new habit to feel like the new normal. So, mm. right, like people sometimes do something for two weeks, they're like, oh my gosh, it's still so hard. Why does it feel so treacherous? And then they give up, which is really unfortunate because if they just hung in there a little longer, they would realize that it starts to feel so much easier and then it becomes your new pattern and your new go-to. This episode is brought to you by NoCD. Here's a question for you. How do you know when overthinking goes too far? Well, if you're constantly questioning and analyzing every interaction, if you're caught in an endless loop of what ifs, if you feel paralyzed by fears of what might happen, if it's eating up hours of your day and causing you a ton of stress, you might be dealing with more than overthinking. These experiences can be symptoms of obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD. Because the thing is, there's so much more to OCD than just hand washing or organizing. OCD can manifest in many ways, and sometimes it can be mistaken for anxiety or overthinking. That's because it can look like constant worry, intense fear, and stressful unwanted thoughts playing on repeat, no matter what physical or mental actions you take to make them go away. Understanding what OCD really looks like is important because there are so many misconceptions about the condition. So although OCD severely affects millions of people, they often don't even realize it. But if you're struggling with similar symptoms, there's hope because OCD is highly treatable with the right kind of therapy. That means specialized therapy because other forms of therapy won't work for OCD, even ones like talk therapy. 
That's why I want to tell you about NoCD. NoCD provides virtual therapy sessions with licensed therapists trained in specialized treatment designed specifically for OCD, Exposure and Response Prevention Therapy, or ERP. They accept many major insurance plans to help make it affordable and provide always-on support between therapy sessions. To learn more about therapy with NoCD, go to nocdnocd.com and schedule a free 15-minute call with their team. That's nocd.com to learn more and book a free 15-minute call. And as a bonus to you guys, I did a full interview with Patrick McGrath from NoCD. So he talks all about the ERP approach and how NoCD is unique. So check that out on episode 406 of the podcast. All right, let's get back to it. Yeah. Do, do you, so as you've been going through this, given that you do, so so as neuropsychologists, our, our job is kind of to think about the interplay between the brain, you know, behavior, emotions, and how that all works together. So, mm-hmm. you know, your early work in graduate school and in undergrad, you know, you thought about these things broadly, but now you've been trained as a neuropsychologist and know Mm -hmm. a lot about this. Does it change the way that you actually think about it? Like the neurological basis of attachment about changing, you know, your attention and all those things? Yeah. I mean, like you said, we're both neuropsychologists and such a big part of what we do is really understanding the the difference, well, actually the connection between your brain and your behaviors, right? Yeah. And so I feel like more than anything over time, I've become uh, much more of a strong believer that the mind and the body are just so extremely connected, you just can't separate them. I think that there was a time, I think maybe in early in our training or maybe prior to that, where there was this idea of mind-body dualism. Mm. <laughs> and um, I don't think anybody really believes that anymore. Like, yeah. of, of course, the mind and body can function separately, but more so they function together and they, they provide messages to each other. And so people who have insecure attachment, who suffer from lower self-esteem, they tend to have more chronic physical illnesses. They tend to have a lowered immune system. And even if you are not somebody who is particularly interested in the science between that, it, there is science involved. Yeah. Um, because when your mind is under stress all the time, and when your mind feels like it's constantly battling things, that's when these chronic illnesses are more susceptible to developing because your, your physical body is not in its best shape. Yeah, very intertwined. Very entertaining. Yeah. So I, I checked out your, um, I have not read your book yet, but I did uh, speed run a lot of your recent stuff, your TEDx talk and some other interviews and stuff like that. I put it on like 1.5 speed while I was playing video games. So I, I absorbed, uh, you know, I absorbed a lot. Um, and in your TED talk, you talk about um, that you only need to form a healthy attachment, a secure attachment with one person. And that person is yourself. Right. Um, which sounds great but it also sounds like to you know the final boss in some ways you know yeah. um so you're talking about your inner child you're talking about the little you in there and for and forming that attachment and working on that right can you talk more exactly. about how you think of that yeah so you know i think if you talk to me about inner child work uh, a few years ago i would laugh you know mm. um because again that feels like it flies in the face of uh a, a lot of what i couch my work around, which is really scientifically based information. But now I realize that we all have an inner child and that is scientific. And, and, and the reason is the earth, there's these imprints that happen when we're younger and there's certain beliefs that develop and there's these, these unmet needs and wishes of your inner child that never were expressed because at some point it learned that it shouldn't express them, that it needed to grow up really fast. I mean, for whatever reason, they they got these certain messages, but it almost represents this part of your psyche that is like the most pure and the most unbridled. And it's important to listen to it and take care of it because if you don't, then the problems are going to show up in your own adult behaviors and your thinking and, and your feelings. And so this idea of honoring your inner child and listening to your inner child, and then as your adult self, which is much more capable, much more knowledgeable, has much more agency, can provide your inner child with a lot of what it didn't get when it was younger, that is a huge part of the healing. And, and believing in yourself first and foremost is an important part of attachment healing because your caregivers and other people who might have sent certain messages 
to you during your childhood. And again, this is not about blaming parents because parents mostly did the best that they could. Of course, there's that tiny percentage of parents who were just horrible abusers, but that sure. is such a small proportion. Like a lot of times parents were battling their own struggles. They were dealing with their own problems and also passing on what they learned as children from their parents. And so the idea is maybe you didn't get everything you wanted from your parents or their caregivers or whoever was around when you were a child, but now you can give your inner child those things because your adult self knows what it wants if you take the time to listen and has the power and the agency and the skills to do it. And if you're able to trust yourself and, and be able to forge that relationship between your adult self and your inner child, then that's going to radiate out to how you behave in all the other areas of your life. So you're going to be radiating out secure attachment in all the other important domains of life that you find are the most crucial to your well-being. Right. So it could be daunting in a way, but also very, very powerful because you have that ability, right? You, you yes. are now in a place where you can give yourself what you never had before. Right. Um, but of course that requires recognizing what, what your inner child needs. Um, right. your, your book from what I understand is very actionable. A lot of, you know, you mentioned sort of the quiz that you have, there's a lot of exercises and things like that. Does that go, do you go into, how to understand what it is that your inner child didn't get or what it's asking for? Yeah, definitely. And I think that it that's what's so important is having those actionable steps because like you said, it can feel really daunting, um, kind of nice and empowering, like, oh, it's up mm -hmm. to me. But then you're like, oh, but it's up to me. It's up to so me. So <laughs> you can't blame you can't blame anybody else anymore, you know? Um, and so I, I think that that's why it's so important for me in my book to be able to give tangible tips. And so I, I do give a few different varieties of learning about your inner child in different ways because everybody learns differently. So some people are going to say, yeah, that visualization worked for me. But other people are mm -hmm. going to say, I'm not good with visualizations. I can't really imagine that. So I really like one? that. I really yeah. like that because because I so often, you know, I hear on an individual basis from people that are like, well, you know, I went to see this person. They told me meditate. And it's like, I, yeah. the, I cannot do that. That does not work for my brain or journaling exactly. or whatever the thing might be. So not everybody is able to engage exactly the same with all exercises or strategies. Exactly. And that doesn't mean that they're not actually trying to do the work. Maybe that mm -hmm. really is a struggle for them. And so that's why I found it important to basically mix in different types of modalities and different types of exercises that are tangible, just depending on how you best absorb this information. My uh, tip is always to try all of them because you just never know which one's going to work for you. Sometimes yeah. you might have an idea. You might say, well, the visualization is definitely not going to work for me, but maybe this one will, you know, you just never know. So it's important that you build your own toolbox and that mm -hmm. will only happen if you are willing to try everything at least once before you say it doesn't work for me <laughs> some of the assumptions might be based on that attachment right that, yeah right that is the self-talk like oh i can't benefit from this exactly well, maybe we'll see we'll see yeah, yeah. do you I, um just as a personal anecdote you know you mentioned the if i had asked you about the inner child you know a few years ago yeah. you would have laughed and you know mm -hmm. i could i feel somewhat similarly <laughs> not like that i thought there was no validity to it but it just wasn't a big focus of, of what i was doing and then i yes. i grabbed a book of you know it's like the 500 trauma-informed interventions or whatever and there was an exercise in there where you do uh, bilateral like handwriting so you write you know a conversation with your child self right hand yeah. or your dominant hand is your adult self non-dominant hand is his child and i'm like oh let's just try this out and i'm like hey kiddo how you doing and then i'm like Oh, it's just like, 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 you know, I fell apart. I'm like, okay, there's something there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. It's so interesting how powerful it can be. And uh, I was doing uh, inner child work with uh, a colleague of mine that is t totally a skeptic. So I sometimes do these workshops for Med Circle, and mm. uh, it was the host of Med Circle. And he's like, I don't know. But then, like, once I did it, it was a very emotional moment for him as well. And I think it surprised him, you know? Yeah. So I think that sometimes if you're willing to do it, like you said, there might be something there. And sometimes the resistance is because you know there's something there and maybe you're not quite ready to tackle it. So obviously if that's the case, you know, do it with a trusted friend or, or engage a professional to help you through that. But don't just say, I'm not gonna do it because maybe that's gonna be the, the kicker to your healing and a way to jumpstart the work. And, and it, it, it makes sense that, it, that some of these things might feel scary, right? Cause that's, you're talking about that avoidance and that being something that keeps you safe in the short term and you know that there's a reason it feels scary and that's the reason you might need to 
push a little bit more and start approaching it rather than avoiding. Yeah, exactly. And I think that a lot of times we we avoid and we put off because obviously temporarily it feels good. I mean, in some ways, it, it gets reinforced over time because mm -hmm. you get to temporarily step away from that distress, but then it keeps coming back. So until you're ready yeah. to confront it in some way and figure it out, it'll just keep coming back. Have you had any experiences that you'd be willing to share? Um, obviously, you need to respect people's confidentiality and such, but like, have you had any good examples of seeing this really, really play out, the stuff that you talk about in your book in practice? Yeah, I remember when I used to consult for a residential treatment center, there was a woman who came to the facility. She was in her 60s at the time. And lots of complex PTSD, lots of trauma all throughout her life. Mm -hmm. And she was really only at the residential treatment center at her children's insistence. They basically did an intervention on her. And they're yeah. like, look, if you don't, if you don't address your problems, we can't have a relationship with you. So she came, but she was a very unwilling participant. For the first month that she was there, she was really angry and irritable at everyone. She distrusted everyone. She refused to participate in a lot of the treatment or when she was there, she would say really caustic, cynical things. For a, a, for a period of time, she had to be taken out of some of the group sessions because she was disturbing the healing yeah. for other people. Like it wasn't right for the milieu, you know, like other patients yeah. were complaining, like this is not helpful for us. It's actually very triggering, you know? Um, so anyway, this was kind of how she was um, the first month of her treatment. She ended up staying for almost four months. And during the second month, I really noticed that there were really shifts in her thinking. And I think it was because we started to work on some of these concepts and these ideas. Obviously, it was slow start at first. It was really just about education and understanding that she wasn't to blame, but also that at this point in time, she needed to be the person to take the action to heal. Mm -hmm. And the transformation was astounding. I mean, the last month before she left, she was a really kind person, she was able to be empathetic. I think all of that was there all along, but she had just such strong defenses up. And mm. once she realized that she needed to comfort her inner child, understand that the things that had happened to her in childhood, they were not her fault. That was, that was something that she couldn't control. It, but that her inner child was so hurt back then that she didn't really have a sense of safety or a base for that safety. And so creating that that safety for herself through a lot of the work that I described in my book, I think she was gradually able to see that, oh, I don't have to be in a fight or flight all the time. And there are people who want good things for me, including myself, because she actually didn't feel like she deserved any of those things. Sure. And that's one of those subconscious things that just eats at you, but you don't realize that it's happening, you know? So I think she had to believe that she was inherently good and deserved good things. And then she was able to treat her family with more kindness and with more patience. And of course, there was still a lot of anger from her family. Of course. They were mad at Can't her. Can't take for, away what has been done. No. But I think that her family was impressed that she was coming to the table with less defensiveness. And they were starting their healing process too towards the end of that time. I mean, of course, they were gonna keep going to family therapy, keep having those conversations. But I think at the end of her therapy, it was less about, let's just get her out of our hair for a few months and let her work on themselves. They started to see it as a group project. Like, okay, right. we all need to be here at the table together to make this work. And so I felt like that was one of the most successful stories that made me so happy because I think she basically said at one point, during our work together, well, is there any hope for me? You know, I'm in my 60s. Like, I don't know how many years I have left. Is it two mm. years or is it 10? Like, I don't know. And um, it was great to see her make that transformation um, even at that age. And that's why I say it's always possible to heal no matter when in your life and what stage you're at. Sometimes being a little bit older can be beneficial because you don't have the same, you know, you go, 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 go throughout your life and at a certain level, um, if you don't keep all the plates spinning, like th these defenses do serve a purpose, right? Like you yeah. can't uh, ignore your job or not provide for your family or not feed yourself or something like that. And so right. when things finally slow down, you know, and that's one way that it can happen, then the need really arises. And that's like the appropriate time to in some cases, right? Exactly, exactly. And sometimes you have to be brought to that, that level of distress mm -hmm. before you can really s stop and say, okay, I need to fix this. Yeah. Do you remember any particular um, 
like activities that you did or, or types of work that you did um, for that case or for another one that were just like really profound, you know, in the moment? Yeah, I think for her, it was really about picturing her inner child next to her okay. and asking her inner child what the inner child needed. Um, so did you do that like live in session? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So basically I asked her to essentially uh, try to imagine that her adult self was approaching her inner child and imagine your child at any age that you want. And she imagined her child when the inner child when she was five. It was the first time that she had a major trauma. Mm. And um, and I said, you know, just imagine your adult self sitting next to your inner child and asking, what do you need? And like, that's the only question that you need to ask. And then you just wait, you just wait and see what your child is saying. And she started crying in session because the only thing that kept coming back of what the inner child needed is just like love. She just needed to feel loved. She never felt loved at any point mm -hmm. in her life. And ever since this trauma, like she just never, never really felt love from anyone. And I think that really was it. I mean, honestly, it wasn't like it was filled with, you know, a big narrative. It was sure. just this really basic level of like, I've never felt really loved in my life. And anytime somebody says they love me, I always think there's an ulterior motive or I think about when it's gonna go away. So when you think that way, you're not going to treat everybody with the most ultimate intimate empathy and and love yourself because you think it's going to go away so why would you invest in that you know mm. so it made sense and so i you know and then i just said you know just imagine that your adult self is you know giving something encouraging to your inner child like hugging them you know putting your hand on their shoulder like whatever feels the most comfortable and i mean she was just sobbing at that point it was such a difficult moment for her to realize that even as she's had her marriages and like had children through those marriages that she just never felt loved ever. Right. Yeah. Right. Cause you have yeah. to apply that knowledge to everything that, that you've been through up to that Ex point. And it exactly. takes on a different feel. Exactly. And like even her children, so a lot of people will say, well, my child is the one that loves me unconditionally. She didn't even feel that with her children. She just didn't believe mm -hmm. it, you know, and even this recent intervention, it just made her really, ask herself, well, if they really love me, why would they just abandon me? And it's like, well, they're not, they want you to get better, you know, but it was very hard to, to, to get that message across because of course her themes are all about being abandoned and not, not ever being loved. And so, mm. uh, the, even though they wanted to try to get her help, that was her first feeling. And of course that made her more defensive and more angry at her family at the time. Uh, you must have had to grow a lot, you know, even just as a clinician doing that type of work, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, you think of cognitive behavioral therapy, there's a lot of, it's very active, a lot of yeah. back and forth. You know, what you're talking about is like setting a stage and then sitting back probably right. and just waiting through what could be like uncomfortable silence. Right. Just giving it space, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that I had to learn is, oh, just be silent and don't try to fill the space, which of course... Um, in my training years, which is like two decades ago, so crazy, um, <laughs> I, I, I basically was, I am very uncomfortable with silence. <laughs> like, I kept trying to fill You're the just space. Like wiggly. <laughs> yeah, I was like, ah, I feel awkward, you know. Um, but no, I, I think that that's one of the most powerful tools is you just wait. You wait and you let them make the discovery. And mm -hmm. sometimes in that discomfort is like where all the revelations come, you know? So, Definitely that, and also, of course, doing my own work. That's so important, because if you want to help somebody else, you have to have yeah. gone through the exercises yourself or like understand yourself better, because you don't want to carry any of your baggage into your therapeutic work with your patients, and that's super important, too. Yeah. What have you learned about what your inner child has needed throughout this process of, of kind of diving deep into this stuff? Yeah, it's interesting. Like, you know, I feel like in some ways I'm going through a little bit of a midlife crisis now, you know, I'm, I'm in my 40s and it's like, okay, well, what is this next phase of my life going to look like? And I've been so focused on career and achievement and ambition, and that was what I was always rewarded for. So now I'm really kind of sitting and saying, you know, am I a valued person even when I'm not accomplishing anything? And that's that I think has been the hardest um, belief to wrestle with. Um, mm as I've been thinking about it. And I definitely find that right now in this phase of me being a new parent and looking at the way that my child responds, 
Like all he wants is for me to sit with him. He doesn't care what I'm doing that day or what my projects are. Um, right. he's, he's actually learned to say, mama, no work, which is, oh, I know, man. kind of How heartbreaking. <laughs> it was so heartbreaking. It was so heartbreaking. Yeah, he just started saying that last week. He was like, mama, no work. Or he was like, mama, work no more. I mean, he's been, <laughs> and he'll start right sla <laughs> yeah, slamming down my laptop, you know, things like that. And, uh, but you know, yeah. I, and sometimes I'll even think, oh, okay, today we're gonna have like a huge day of fun. We're gonna go to the aquarium. Then we're gonna go to lunch. And all he wants is just for me to sit next to him. He doesn't even need me to do those things. And so it just reminds you of, you know, we all have inherent value even when we're not achieving which i think is something that i need reminders of so mm -hmm. that's something that i think i've been managing myself and that does sound i mean from what you described right about about your upbringing that does sound very uh, much like something your inner child could use uh, reassurance about totally that, you know your value isn't only in your output yeah exactly have you slowed down a bit in, in terms of uh, how much you're doing? Because I mean, people who aren't already aware of you may not really understand how busy you have been. <laughs> You've been everywhere, like yeah. like you on know, TV shows and podcasts and one-off TV shows and writing and like, you've done a lot, right? So yeah. um, <laughs> like, have you, have you, right now, when you talk about this midlife crisis, are things slowing down a little bit? Yeah, I definitely think that I am trying to have more balance in my life. Like, I know that ambition and achievement is still important to me, but it's not so much about just achieving because I want to say I have another uh, award or accolade. Like, that's not what it's about. I think it's more about, am I making a meaningful impact in someone's life today? So that's mm. something that I've been thinking about a lot. And then the other piece of it is just, am I a little bit better of a person today than I was yesterday. That's been something that I've been really trying to work on. Like, is there some small improvement that I'm making incrementally every day um, mm -hmm. in terms of who I am? Like, am I a little bit more patient today or can I try to be more patient today than I was yesterday? You know, just things like that. So I, I definitely find that it's, maybe it's not so much of a slowing down, but it's about balancing my life with other activities. Like, before I would work seven days straight, it was like not a problem. Now I'm very cognizant of you need to have at least one day where you're not doing any work. Like that's important. And also that's mm. a time that you can recharge. So you can do work in a better way the, the following week, you know, but again, when you're younger, you feel like you don't need any of those things. And you just think there's so many things piling up. You have to get to it today. But a lot of things that we make um, as emergencies in our minds really are not emergencies. <laughs> so that's also something that I've been trying to learn in my wiser, older years. <laughs> <laughs> wiser, older, you're not that old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I hear what you're saying. I hear yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. You know, on the, um, the parenting side, I think there's a lot of people, you know, a lot of people that I know, um, not excluding myself from this, a lot of people in my audience, you know, when they think about attachment, their concern isn't necessarily just with themselves, but with their kids, right? Yes. You know, because, you know, there's a lot of talk about if you model distress to your child, then they learn that what they do is distressing and things of that sort. But, but like, how do you handle that when you are legitimately distressed sometimes as a parent, whether you have your own mental health difficulties or physical health issues that, you know, you worry about how that's going to impact your kids. Mm -hmm. um, how do you, how do you think about that? Especially now that you have a kid. Yeah. You know, I think that it's, um, it's really about, Knowing that there's no such thing as a perfect parent, <laughs> um, that's important. Sometimes we, we get so caught up in, oh, did I do the right thing just in that moment? Um, and I don't think that that's so, so crucial. I think that what's more important than ever is really being able to acknowledge where some of your stress points are and knowing that you can um, communicate to your child when things go awry, when maybe you don't do exactly what you wish you were doing. Um, but also letting them know that they're not responsible for what's going on with you. I think that it mm. can be so hard to do that, right? Sometimes we make our kids feel responsible for how we feel. And I think it's important for them just to know that they can be kids and it's not about pretending your life is okay, right? So if you're going through a stressful time, you can say, hey, mommy or daddy, we're going through a, a stressful time right now, but we just want you to know that we're still here for you 
Um, but if I seem a little bit distracted, that's what that's about. That's not about you though. And you don't have to feel like you need to do anything to fix it. I just want to let you know, or like, I apologize for losing my temper with you. I'm going through something right now. I'm going to mm. try not to do that with you, you know, but I think it's okay to recognize and, and, and tell them that verbally, but do it in a way that doesn't make them feel responsible for what you're going through. That I think will really help to foster secure attachment in your kids. I can't tell you how many people that I, that, that I have worked with or have known that have said something to the effect of, they might see me apologize to one of my kids for something that got out of hand or something that mm -hmm. I that I want to make sure that they understand it wasn't their fault. And they're like, I don't even know what that is. Can I, I can't even imagine my parent ever having apologized to me for something or taking accountability for something. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that that's so important just to let your kids know that they can be children, you know? Mm-hmm because that, mm -hmm. that time goes by so fast. And then you do have to be responsible for so many things. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. true. That's true. Yeah. Before we kind of start the process of wrapping up, I'm curious, is there, so now you have this book out, you know, you're obviously talking a lot about attachment and how that plays into now day-to-day -day life for people. Mm -hmm. What's coming next? Like, are you, is there anything that you are looking forward to or anything that you're excited about that's on the horizon? Is there any way that you're looking to expand the scope of what you're doing? Yeah. You know, I think that for me, it's just been really exciting to get more of the attachment work out to people in a way that hopefully is understandable and makes them feel like they can take action so right now I'm just most interested in continuing to talk about this and have conversations with people about it. Um, being able to, uh, connect the dots for as many people as possible. You know, I really love writing, so maybe one day I'll write a third book, but right now, um, I've been really, really grateful to be able to put this out into the universe. And I feel like, I just feel like we need it more than ever. So it's been very fulfilling just to keep talking about this book with, with people and seeing how it can help them. Yeah. Um, thank you for giving me a second chance and talking with you. It's been a really good <laughs> conversation. Um, what would you direct people towards? So obviously your book, um, mm -hmm. that's, I'm assuming, available basically everywhere. Yes. Yep. Okay. Amazon, wherever books are sold, essentially. Yep. Where else would you want people to um, find you? Well, follow me on social media. I'm at Dr. Judy Ho and Instagram is my primary platform. And also you can get free resources and sign up for my newsletter at drjudyho.com. Okay, cool. Thank you, Judy. Thank you.